Five seconds. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Five <laughs> Gerald <seconds>. saving us. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we're just gonna, you know, record this podcast without any recording. <laughs> okay, ten seconds starting now. Okay, that's ten according to Audacity. Okie dokie. <clears throat> okay. Let's do this. Okay. Oh wait, I don't have a script. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. Three, two, one. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today we're discuss we're discussing I can't do this. Okay, I'm doing it yeah, over again. And scene. Do it. And scene. Okay. <laughs> oh. okay. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today we're discussing The Heart Goes Last by Margaret Atwood. I'm Anise, and with me are Gerald and Maya. Hey, guys. Hey, Hello. how are you doing? Good. How are you guys? <laughs> I'm so excited. This is our first, like, official episode. I know. It's, it's a little, little nerve-wracking. Whole new podcast, whole new concept. I'm hoping people really like this. Yeah, I hope some people read along with us. Uh, and comment as well. And even if they don't, just listen to our voices, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I think if people want to comment on Twitter, if we use the hashtag LRH Book Club, that would be really cool, and that way we can all see each other's comments about the books that we're reading. And we should probably do a language warning because this book has sex bots in it. And so, yeah. <laughs> so this is your warning that either if you have children in the room or if you don't want to be spoiled, turn the podcast off, return at a later time. <laughs> yes. Okay. Read the book. So, because this book has sex bots in it, for some reason, I feel like asking Gerald specifically. Gerald, how did you? Gerald, how do you feel about sex bots? Excuse me. Is I'm British? Um, <laughs> that was the question again. Sorry, I wasn't listening. Sure. Yeah, just how did you feel about the book? Did, did you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Liked it a lot. Liked it a lot. I, it's my first Margaret Atwood, and um, didn't know what to expect. Didn't have any sort of preconceptions. Um, and like like you said, when you, when you first got it and you started reading it, you said, "I'm straight in there." And I was just the same. You just she pulls you in with her writing, and and it was just a fascinating story. Really liked it. Yeah, I really liked it as well. And it's funny because, excuse me. I've only read one Margaret Atwood book before. Um, I read The Handmaid's Tale, which uh, seemed to have a lot more serious tone, and this story had a lot more humor in it. It wasn't as deep, necessarily, as um, The Handmaid's Tale, but there was something about it that was really enchanting, and, and we can go more into how it was structured that I found really interesting, but there was also certain way, something about the way it was structured that made it so that you kept wanting to read more and more and more. Yeah, it's funny you guys say that. So I've read um, Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, and in a way I was, I was kind of disappointed with this book. And the more I thought about it, the more disappointed I would be. Because, so she's doing some things that are similar to the Mad Adam trilogy. She's taking on a problem she sees today. She's exaggerating it into the future, and then creating a dystopia, and then creating a plot around that. But the Madam Trilogy world is so much more detailed, and the plot is so woven into those details. Whereas this one felt like, here's a dystopia. It's a little, to me, felt a little ham-fisted, and then the plot doesn't need the dystopia, really. Yeah. Um, you know, I... Hmm. At first, I will say I was disappointed in the... Like, okay, it's hard for me because I read The Handmaid's Tale and The Handmaid's Tale is like, you know, that is one of those high school books that changes your worldview on things. Like you read that in high school and it's like a religious conversion. And and so coming from that high to this funny, slightly quirky, really odd um, story at first was disappointing. But she did something that I just had to give her mad respects for. She took some of the most uncomfortable, basic human instincts, and she just went in all hogs. She did not pull back. She just jumped in both feet. And thoughts that I'd had that I always thought, yeah, I'm the only person thinking this because that's just really messed up. She's just like, blah, there it is. I'm like, wow. And so it kind of made me accept that. But it really is not as deep as a book as her other, as The Handmaid's Tale. Um, 
I was didn't this start out as a series uh, as like a serial? Yeah, like like a series of novella, the pro, the Positron series, which she it wasn't uh, self published, but it was like a like a really indie, like not her main publisher. Yeah, she published that um, for her with her. Um, so she had more control over it. But, okay, so you said that there was some stuff that she said that to you was like, I'm the only one that thinks this. Can you think of, like, one example where you were like, who else? Oh, I remember the first time um, I saw Real Dolls. Mm. Mm. And for um, people that don't know and don't have their children in the room, just saying. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The Real Dolls are really realistic, um, Adult play dolls. <laughs> I'm going to say that in a very. They're uh, about five foot six. They look really real. They came out mid '90s, I think. And um, when I first saw them, my first thought was, Huge. "I'm surprised they don't have a children's version." I know what you and, mean. Yeah. Yeah, because it makes total sense. And so. Um, to see that, like, like she just went in. Like, she didn't say, oh, that's going to make readers too uncomfortable. I'm not going to put that in the book. Like, she took it to its logical conclusion. Um, it, it made me go, okay, she's doing some interesting things here. That was the first one that, like, is on the top of my head. Um, there were other things, um, like the, <laughs> like Stan's relationship with Jocelyn. It was really uncomfortable really uncomfortable. It's not often we see men in the victim role and it was almost a dominatrix slave scenario and she did not pull away from it. And I appreciate how modern this story feels. It feels like it's something from like a young writer. And I gotta say Margaret Atwood, like she's a much older woman. You do not expect her to be writing this stuff. And I love her for it because she does not do this thing where that a lot of female writers do where the women are morally superior, they're not really deep villains, or if they are a villain, they're really they're not multidimensional. They they're not icky. And some of the women in this story are really icky. And I love that. I love having icky female characters and male characters that feel really real, that are being victimized, uh, <laughs> that are doing the non-traditional male role in this book. And, um, yeah, those were, the, those were three things in particular that immediately made me go, okay, I'll put up with the fact that this book is kind of shallow. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the thing with the dolls, what, what sort of shocked me more was not the fact that they were, they were building them, but, but the fact that that they just accepted that you know yeah that's that's what's going to happen, and 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 that made me feel a little uncomfortable. But but it it shines a light on on on. Society. And it did happen for a little while. Yeah. Real Doll never made a children's version, but there were a lot of men that were ordering the Asian version, um. and they were putting pretty young hairstyles on that Asian version because the Asian version was smaller, and uh, yeah, it was a little icky, but. Wow. You know, and there was this whole debate of, you know, there was a law that was passed that would make it illegal to even have, like, drawings of children. And so there was this whole debate of, is that a coping mechanism or is that, like, an entry-level drug? And that was going on. And in the book, they had that exact same conversation that was, like, this undercurrent conversation that I remember having where everyone was just kind of icked out. (laughs) Well, how else would you say it? Like, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have. There was a lot of discomfort in this book, and the fact that it was so humorous and that the scenes were so short allowed for that discomfort without making the reader want to stop reading. Yeah, so that's something I was going to say. Despite recognizing my disappointment early on, I still kept going with it because her writing has a way of just like dragging you through because it feels kind of like popcorn. It's really like easy to just keep going to the next sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, But I want to go back to what you said about Jocelyn. I had a hard time conceptualizing, not how she looks, but the, the character, the psyche of Jocelyn. Like for me, I couldn't, like she... A lot of the okay, so a lot of the characters, the characters are probably the most disappointing part for me because in the Adam, uh, the Mad Adam trilogy, 
the characters are so amazing. Like, you're, like, rooting for Toby. You're rooting for Zeb. I wasn't rooting for anyone here, even though the plot should have you rooting for someone. I didn't enjoy spending time in Charmaine or Stan's heads. I thought they were both just kind of... Like, they, they were meant to be unlikable, but they were unlikable in a way that it felt bland to me. Like, they weren't even unlike... Like, Jocelyn was unlikable in a way that was interesting. I wanted to dissect her, but I couldn't because I didn't believe someone like Jocelyn could exist. Like, the mix of, like high morals, ideals, and integrity, plus master-slave, you know, sex-slave thing that she was doing. I'm like, where, where does her, where's her moral compass? It was jumping around so much that I struggled to believe she was real. Yeah, for me, um, I like the fact that none of the characters were quote-unquote good or rootable or morally superior. I felt like all the characters had this great ambiguity that I believe is the natural human condition. Like, and maybe that's because I come from a very Buddhist mindset on how I view human beings, but I don't view human beings as having, as being good or bad. Like, to me, everybody's gray. Everything is gray. <laughs> it's just, we're all a little messed up, and we're all a little not messed up, and that's just the way we are. And so as I was reading this, I felt like that was a strength in the story, the fact that everybody was doing these things that felt really human to me. Now, Jocelyn, her confusing mental compass did not bother me, but that might be because I have spent time in the kink community. And so she has this moral compass, but she is has these interests and in the way she's treating him. She's giving in to this darker side of herself, and she's going back and forth. did not necessarily feel like a conflict to me, but I can see how that could look like a conflict to somebody else. You know, I've had in-depth conversations about how you can be a slave if you're a feminist. So for me, all this gray area didn't bother me. I'm like, you know, I embrace the gray, but it was, I can see how that would really turn off a lot of readers because most people expect to have at least one character that you're going to root for, that it's a good guy. Maybe they have a few negative parts, but they're really obviously the person that you're supposed to root for. And in this book, there's nobody that you're supposed to root for because all the humans are a little messed up. I I quite I quite like the fact now I slightly disagree that that um, I was definitely rooting for for both Stan and Charmaine initially and you know the poor people who got kicked out of their jobs and lost their house and da, 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 you know it happens a lot and and you know they're, they're just trying to sort of keep going and trying to keep going and and they've got a very strong bond together. Um, and you know, despite, yeah, before they got to Positron. Yeah, d despite those terrible situation, the, the terrible situation they were in, and once they'd made that decision and and gone to uh, gone to the sort of Positron uh, experiment, you could you then saw them change, and like you say, everyone's got these sort of you know darker sides and and lighter sides uh, so you saw the darker side come out and and you started to dislike them a little bit more um, and then at the end you started to like him again because they were in this situation and, and uh, they, they were sort of victims of of the the overarching conspiracy um, and, and I quite like that I quite like that sort of you know good guy bad guy goodbye you know sort of tug um, yeah. So, so who who you who you think is good actually isn't, and vice versa. So, I, I, I quite enjoyed that that change in their characters as, as the book went along. I think the change was really necessary because there are so many really mm. bad decisions that are made. That if we hadn't have had that first, you know, couple, I'll call them chapters. I don't know because I read the ebook version. We can talk a little bit about my problems with the ebook version, um, but the first few chapters it allowed you to feel close to the characters. I think if we hadn't have had that time, it was like a kill the cat moment, if we hadn't had that time to kind of like them, then when they started making all these really bad decisions, it would have turned us off too soon. I think it would have been a less, much less enjoyable read um, without that. But the intro was, was much more traditional as far as story structure. Um, I don't know, in, in the book, in the book version, are the chapters, you know, you have the heading, the title, and then, like, if they're really short, or is multiples of those a chapter? 
No, they're really, okay. they're really short. They're really short. Yeah. Yeah. Those short chapters, they were like freaking Lay's potato chip. Okay. Yeah. Because the ebook version, I have a problem with the ebook version. The ebook version does not use page numbers. And I hate ebooks that don't use page numbers. They use a stupid location system. And so you can't go back and forth between the audiobook and the paper version because you have no idea where the hell you are. And it makes it really difficult to know how much farther you've got to go. But on the plus side, it would tell me like how many more minutes to go to the end of the chapter. And so I was reading these chapters. It was like seven minutes to read this chapter. <laughs> it's like, okay, then I'll read it. Eight minutes to read this. Oh, okay, I'll read it. And so it was really helpful that way. But I think I might have actually enjoyed this particular book more on paper than on ebook because of just how the ebook version was structured a little funny. It was frustrating not having those page numbers. And I know companies do that so that Amazon can't do whisper sync because, you know, they want to go. <clears throat> but um, that was annoying. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just real quick wanted to go back to the to the characters. So I was just going to say, yeah, I agree that Charmaine and Stan are unlikable in parts, but they're unlikable in a way that felt very basic, like you can recognize them. All of their errors don't seem incongruent with who they are, the way that Jocelyn felt to me, where Jocelyn felt, it was just like too many extremes in Jocelyn. Like the marriage of good and bad behavior in Stan and Charmaine felt like normal people, and Jocelyn felt just ugh, too saint and too sinner on both ends. Because I understand what you're saying about the kink, about the, the kink culture, but kink culture also emphasizes consent. Stan is not Yes, I'm not saying she's kinky. I'm saying that because I spent time in that, I'm a little bit more willing to accept extremes. Yeah, like, and I, I have why... less of a problem of like yeah. holding two diametrically opposed you know, philosophies at the same time. Whereas most people would read that and be like, pick a side. Like, yeah, well, it, it's you're not, not going to do both. Yeah, it's not that she wouldn't be into the master role. It's just master role without consent, that rapey quality to it, was where I was yeah. like, that was the part that was a little like, mm, I don't yeah. know. I, yeah. I, I, you know, but what I liked about that, her... Mm -hmm. yeah, that, 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 is, that is part of society, isn't it? So I, I, th I think it's... And I think it's it's interesting that she she is shining a light on on all different and slightly slightly unusual parts of society. Um, so I it didn't, although I have you know no <laughs> obviously I have no <laughs> experience of, of 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 people like that. Um, I I I was sort of completely at ease with the character of, for for being like that. Well, I liked it because a lot of times when we see people in books, literature, or even when you think of what a rapey person would be, you don't picture them as having any good qualities. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always all bad. And I thought it was interesting that A, she was a woman, because if those aren't qualities we necessarily see in women or expect to see in women, but that also she was so bad, but still had certain pockets of morality that she adhered to. And I think that's more normal. I don't think, like, if you went into the prison system and talked to a bunch of murderers and rapists, there are going to be certain things that they're like, no, that's too far. No, those people are bad. Like, everybody has that. Even though they're bad, they're going to look at somebody else and be like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe they would do that. They're a horrible person. They're evil. And you're like, but you're a murderer. And they're like, but that's a rapist. <laughs> you know? And so I, I see that as normal and, and natural human gray area. And so I thought it was... To me, that's something I liked about Jocelyn. But yeah, you know, she was really out there. And I liked, um, you know, I felt like the idea of having the prison offset the town and having people volunteer to be prisoners, um, you know, obviously that had a really strong political message about the privatization of prisons, but I felt like it was perhaps a bit ham-fisted, you know, um, it, f it felt a bit heavy-handed. I'll, I'll say that. I think it could have been done a little bit with a little bit more subtlety. But I felt like the fact that she took it to its natural extremes m made it much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing about that sort of ham-fisted, not detailed setting, like the whole premise, was then the plot to me in many areas, I was pushing back against it. So, like, for mm. example, the whole thing with Stan, I'm like... 
why Vegas, why Elvis, why the Maryland? How does that tie into the theme? How does that tie into the point of the book, which she does in the Matt Adam trilogy? Like everything, even if it's silly, even if it's funny, there's a purpose to it that this seemed to lack. And also, why did they need Stan? Why couldn't Veronica get the USB drive out with the files? Like at what point was Stan key to the plot? Which was something that just at no point made sense. Yeah, I, I think he was only key to the plot because Jocelyn was pissed off. And so yeah. he was just like, she just picked him for the job. Yeah, and it seemed like um, such a huge risk for somebody who's so motivated to stop all the injustices happening in Positron to, like, potentially blow it because she wants to get even with her. Because she's, yeah, she's got a little bit of an evil side. I also think his wife's job gave them opportunity that they wouldn't have had if they had chosen somebody else. Yeah, but it could have been Veronica. Veronica was already out with the blue teddy bear, that whole thing. You know, why not Veronica? You could get the USB to her. That, that was, yeah, there was something there I was just like, I don't... There was a but would Veronica have taken the USB or would she gone into the woods with her little teddy bear and just never come out? <laughs> should be you like, know what? I love teddy the bear. fact that they figured out how to make a woman imprint on something, like totally Stepford Wives style, and then they screwed it up and she imprinted on a teddy bear. That was awesome! <laughs> Because you know if that ever actually happened, that that would happen. Somebody would, it, like, you'd have people imprinting on windows, <laughs> imprinting on the doctor. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Like, Jocelyn, who's, like, so against all of the immoral things that Positron's doing, is, like, but she's, like, an arbiter of justice, dealing it out however she wants it. And she's, like, but you know what? I'm still going to do it to Max. I'm still going to take away Max's agency. I'm going to make him imprint on Aurora because I feel like it, and I'm pissed. I'm, like, you're not that different from Ed. No. But, you know, I think that's part of the point. Mm -hmm. You know, that even people that think they're doing the right thing, that think they're morally superior, they're not. They're mm -hmm. still human. They still do bad things. Um, it's just that they're, they're, you can only see things from your own eyeballs, and every person thinks they're the good person in the story. And so, to me, that was actually part of the point of the book, um, one of the underlying themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think for me... It, it... Yeah, that that was the the key point because it's 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 near future dystopia or is it present day dystopia? It's it's a very very thin line. So it, you know it takes easily recognisable characters and situations and just stretches them a little bit and 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 it becomes so much more believable because of that. You, it sort of grounds it in present day. Uh, our present day understanding of situations and then just stretches it and stretches it and 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 it, and it sort of pulls you along with it. You know, I think Margaret Atwood is probably one of the only authors that I've read a contemporary alternate dystopia universe story and had it work. Like this story it definitely felt like it was current day but like slightly skewed like slightly off and a lot of times when writers do that they lose you you can't believe it because it just feels too much like today and this felt very much like today or within like you know within 15 years of today and at the same time it was just slightly skewed but it was skewed in a way that felt really balanced so I was able to go with it I think if she had done if she'd skewed it a little bit more she would have lost me she would have pulled back a little bit I wouldn't have believed it I feel like she got that balance and I think that's really hard to do I don't I haven't read a lot of authors that can do that I, I, I think he, even by the choice of car that they lived in if if they'd have had a you know a van to live in then they'd have been a lot more comfortable so and you could totally see that and, and you could totally you know I live in fan part of the year whereas because it's a small car you think wow that's a bit you know it's just that little bit little bit sort of stretchy a little bit think oh that's that's a bit unusual and then you go with that and then you go with it a little bit more so I, I think you're right I think she does she does do that sort of very near future dystopia really well and that's definitely a talent of hers because I keep going back to the Matt Allen trilogy because there are some parallels here because the Mad Adam trilogy, the dystopia, so instead of being um, the, the prison system, what she takes is kind of like how corporations are pretty much, and, and private companies have taken over a lot of like government, especially in America, and are becoming like entities in and of themselves. She takes that to its kind of like conclusion where corporations pretty much have like, like 
compounds where everybody like lives there, works for the corporation. Everybody outside of it is basically in a ghetto. So either work. For so the in other words, it's Google. It's kind of like Google, or it's kind of like um, is it in the suburbs of of Atlanta? Like they have a they have a private company where like this entire neighborhoods that are like exempt from participating in the the civic process that has to do with like the ghettos or like the low income areas and they managed a way to like zone it the way that there's like a green zone in like Iraq right where there's like a bunch of American private companies so she takes that idea and she takes it she warps it and it's funny because in her dystopia pharmaceutical companies come out on top but that one the level of detail because then it's this but then there's what are the counter activists that come out out of it. There isn't even just one. There's like multiple groups that are trying to like subvert that order. Um, and what are their goals? And there's like one that's like more religious. There's one that's more environmental that is trying to like protect the environment because the environment also comes into that, tri that trilogy as well. With this one, it felt like the prison system's messed up. I'm going to throw in a few lines in the first hundred pages about what's messed up about it but then kind of abandons that premise for the rest of the book. That, I think, was was most disappointing for me. I wanted her and to I go think full the problem, I think what the problem is with this book is that it was five novellas, or mm. however many. I think it was five. Um, I think they were separate stories and, that were related, and novella structure is different from novel structure, and I think trying to make them into one novel has inherent weaknesses. And so I don't think this is a problem with the writing. I don't think this is a problem with the world building. I think this is a problem with the structure. Mm -hmm. I think that this isn't a novel. And um, if I had read these stories, you know, five different stories, you know, reading other things in between, I think I might have actually enjoyed it more. Um, than reading it all at once because the structure just it's 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 off which you don't expect from Outwood you don't expect it to be off because she's such a genius and so I'm much more willing to chalk it up to an inherent weakness in the whole concept of taking novellas and smushing them together mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting yeah I, I think I think when you look at the story as a whole you can see you can see the joins almost, can't you? That you know, mm -hmm. the different yeah. sections where, where um, and and the the style of the story, the, the the sort of what it is seems to change um, across those stories. So the last part, for instance, that I, I wrote this earlier, it, it it sort of becomes more of a, a straightforward thriller type thing. You know, are they, are they going to get away and the baddie's going to get them? That sort of thing. Um, yeah. I really wish she'd left them as novellas and just put them together as an anthology. Mm. Because frankly, the novella has been getting the novella used to be like the standard novel, you know, um, early nineteenth century, whatever. Like everything was novella size. We didn't get these big, huge, bloated novels until much later because of publishing rules and cost of printing and stuff. And I feel like if anybody could have brought the novella back, Margaret Atwood could have brought the novella back. And I felt. I feel like it originally was published on such a small format and then to finally get it more wide distribution but have it in novel form kind of sucks because it would have been really cool to have five novellas by Margaret Atwood come out. Yeah. Though a friend of mine who read the Matt Adam trilogy, she and I read a lot of like the same books. We have a lot of overlap. Um, and she's a patient reader. But she started reading the Positron series, the novella, and I don't think she got past the third. And when I told her we were doing The Heart Goes Last for this podcast, she was like, uh. <laughs> she was like underwhelmed, you know? Oh, and, really? Yeah. And I, I think it has to do a little bit with, I don't think it's, I, I think you're right that the structure is part of what's holding it back. But I think there's a little, I think, I think you used the word shallow earlier, and I think that's right. I think there's a shallowness here that isn't in her other books, which seems mm -hmm. like harsh because I love her. Um, and also... I was struck by how sex heavy this book is. She doesn't shy away from sex. She doesn't shy away from rape. That also comes up in her other books. Um, but in this one, it was so like over the top that it deadened it. And it also deadened any opportunity for a ca There was no counterpoint to it. There was no like consensual like love or anything. Where in past books, you know, she goes, she she doesn't shy away from the sex stuff, but. Toby and Zeb, they're these like 
to older people in the post-apocalyptic phase of the Mad Adam trilogy trilogy and they're like falling in love and she teases you the whole time with thinking you she's finally going to give you like them being affectionate and she never does and it's so frustrating and it keeps you like more involved in their in their story that this one just lacked like I, I, I was like where's my Toby and Zeb you know no. yeah really the only somewhat healthy sexual relationship is bland and unsatisfying and makes them both cheap Which actually I kind of appreciate it. It's like <laughs> the only people that like, it's just such like a we've been married too long type of sexual relationship. It's like okay, yeah. <laughs> you know um, when I say shallow and as far as um, the novella structure, I think if this had been written as a novel, knowing the way she writes, it would have been easier to have multiple threads throughout. Mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think because it was novella structure, I think, and because it was somewhat comical, it, mm -hmm. there weren't as many threads as there could have been. Yeah. It, it for me, it lacked the sharp social critique about today. That's what it was lacking. Like, oh really? Oh, I got the sharp critique for today. It just wasn't nuanced. Right. Like it was just. She had like a few. Like, but. Like where, where's what's what's the main takeaway that she wants us to take away from like the prison system? So she's starting there. She has a few lines, but she doesn't really develop it throughout the story. Where you're like, yeah, that's where we're heading. You know, mm -hmm. like she's she starts where we are now and then doesn't. You know, um, a couple things that I had problems with. One, there are no gay characters in this book. <laughs> like, how do they have this huge society? Everybody's having sex like bunnies, and everybody's heterosexual, which was kind of like surprising me. <laughs> I think I think Positron selected them out. I think it's the fifty. I th I think it must be yeah. the uh, But it would have been interesting to have had like a gay couple show up and get weeded. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been a really interesting critique. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, okay, the chickens. Okay. Um, <laughs> And it's funny because I had this thought as I was reading it and then I went on Goodreads and like the first review I read was like, how come the guys are resorting to having sex with chickens if they're only in there for a month? Like, really? Mm. You're only in there for a month. <laughs> like, how frustrating can you be? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think you can make friends with your hand if it's only a month. <laughs> no, but I thought it was, I thought it was, remember the beginning, the Positron prison was a real prison. It had real inmates. They didn't get the month off. They were stuck in there the whole time. And oh, then so it you think it started with them and then it spread? <laughs> like became like a thing, which is still yeah. like weird, but. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of reminded me yeah. of that. Um, there was a PETA video that came out where people had gone undercover in a poultry um, factory and they'd actually recorded that kind of behavior with poultry workers. It kind of yeah, I didn't eat chicken for a year. <laughs> possible though that that will got that idea there she's like very she's into internet culture oh yeah she's totally into internet culture because there were so many things in here that I'm like that happened and I remember that news story yeah <laughs> also when she describes Aurora's plastic surgery face as a fail face mm. <laughs> there were some yeah. really some really good funny laugh out loud moments in in it she she did I think she did really well to to, to, to mingle in humor to, to this sort of fairly bleak story. There were a lot of those moments. Um, I was um, reading it in the middle of the night, and it was like 3 a.m. I can't remember where it was, but all of a sudden I just started laughing. I was like, really? You went there. And I could not stop laughing. <laughs> yeah, no, she's brave, and she's very young. Like, the same thing kind of, like, happens in... um. Like, for the third Mad Adam one, she somehow, like, learned about, like, the dark web and how people get through and, like, the the second internet. And I'm just like, it, it, I know, it's like you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. You're like, here's, like, this, like, older Canadian this lady. sweet older lady, you know? Yeah, this sweet She's older not. Canadian lady who's, like... <laughs> Trolling on the internet all the time, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's awesome. She's awesome on Twitter. I, I, I love her on every level. Because <laughs> she is very young, and her books feel current. Her books don't feel older. They don't feel stayed. They feel brave. They feel fresh. 
even this one with its weaknesses it felt fresh it did not feel like something I'd read before in any way and it's 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 not pretentious and it's not I, I've read I've read um, later books by people who have had literary success in in their career, earlier in their career and it becomes you know so non-edited it's you know mm -hmm. I have this big literary this is this is what I've written. You don't need to edit it, sort of thing. And and, and the the books become horrible and bloated. And but this isn't. This is this is you know really. It's it's a good story. I really enjoyed the story. You know what? When I was reading it, my first thought was this would have made a really good graphic novel because it had fewer layers. It was a little more simple. It had some really funny parts, but it was really like pushed by plot. I would have liked to have seen this done as a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have worked better. Mm, yeah. But because it was so visual. Like, there were so mm -hmm. many things that you had to see. You had to see yeah. in your mind. Actually, for some reason, it just, this just hit me right now. So, I think part of the reason why there is a social criticism for me that's missing the incisive point is because we're in Charmaine and Stan's heads. Like, they're the most basic people. Like, they're so basic. And they don't think critically. Where, with the, again, Matt Adam trilogy, because it's most similar to that, Toby is a very smart, critical, activist type. So mm -hmm. she's constantly thinking about everything because I remember when Charmaine is watching Homefront with Lucinda Kwan or remembering it, and it's basically like poverty porn. It's like her going around like, look at all the stuff you lost. Look at how terrible your life is. If Toby was watching that, there would be some like sharp criticism of like, why are we airing this, where Charmaine is like, it's not just me, because she's so basic. So it's almost like relying on the reader to already be a sharp, critical, left-leaning, you know, activist. Because if you're not, it just, you it know... It goes right over your head. And that's what's interesting to me, because, okay, so you're writing a book with some social criticism. <clears throat> if you're writing a book that is political criticism, and you don't want to tell the reader what to feel about it, you end up in this conundrum where who should be your narrator? Because if the narrator was a really critical left-leaning person, then it feels preachy and like the author is talking down to you as a reader. Where, But if you have the main character that you're looking at be a more basic person, then you're left feeling like, well, where's the critique? And it definitely feels like this huge catch-22 of where you want to go with it. I personally like novels that don't tell me what to think, but if you're writing a political novel, that's really difficult to do, I think. Yeah, yeah. plus not only that, like if you don't at some point say what the critique is, then you're basically only preaching to the choir because the only people who are going to get your message are the people who already think that way. Uh, There's no comment. I don't There's know. When, when, when I read The Handmaid's Tale as a kid, okay, yeah. I was at that crucial age where everybody wants to be a communist and everyone's reading Che Guevara and freaking, you know, talking about, you know, Scout. Okay, so in that age group, we were a little more susceptible to it, but I feel like there are certain books that didn't necessarily tell you what to believe, but they showed you what was happening and then you instantly came to a, a feeling or a decision personally. And yeah, that book was probably even more, but it never blatant, like it, it it led me to its natural conclusion without telling me what to feel. I never yeah, felt like I was being talked down to. Yeah, but it, but it, but it, it led you there by giving you the horrors of horrors. Whereas this yeah, book, but I feel like that's what this does. It's showing you all this stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if perhaps it had had more layers or been maybe a little less funny, um, for, for a young person who maybe grew up in, in a very conservative household, it could possibly change the way they view things. You know, for us, maybe not, because we're pretty left-leaning, you and I, but I can see, you know, a high schooler reading this and being like, oh, wow, maybe I need to think about this. This is kind of messed up, like, what's happening? And it could change the world's view. Maybe not as potently as Handmaid's Tale, because Handmaid's Tale was... Like, to me, that's one of the top books of the last century. Um, you know, it changed so much thought. It's like Catch-22. It, it's like Catcher in the Rye. It's one of those books. This one is not one of those books, but I think for a younger reader, it could 
be close. So I won't take that away. I think for me, no, because I, it is teaching to the choir for me. Um, and so I maybe have different expectations or need different things from it than, quote unquote, a, you know, tabula rosa of a reader. What about you, Gerald? Did you feel like the critique was there? Or was... Yeah, I, I think... I I, th I think the critique is there. I think the critique is there, but it's, but to me it's it's done quite subtly because because of this near future uh, status quo of having recognisable situations and recognisable characters, and then and then to 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 deal with their situation, you know, they see this this advert and 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 to me I can see why they would think. This looks great. You know what? What are the downsides? What have we got to lose? We got we got nothing here. So let's go this way, and that and she's taking you down the path that the that making those decisions and offering those choices to people. Um, she she's showing you where that can lead. So I, I think that 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 critique of of, of modern society is there, but it, it's done in, in a subtle way. You know what you said just made me think of something. In this story, we see Stan and Charmy in their car, poor, you get the sense that the world has fallen apart, and then they see this ad, and they go there, and, you know, they've got this town with, these, with the prison and everything. But we don't have a point where that, that whole system became the natural conclusion, whereas in Handmaid's Tale, it starts off low birth rate, and then all of a sudden, they cut off all of the electronic money. That's how they get control. They just, all of a sudden, no one's ATM cards work. Only people with money, their ATM cards work. And it was, it eased you into that world in such like a logical way that you never questioned what they were doing. It was messed up. You were like, this feels real. Like, I remember reading that book and opening my wallet and being afraid of my ATM card for, like, months after reading that. Because it was like, it was like this sudden feeling that a government could do that. If a government were to take every, all the banks and say, freeze everybody's funds today, that could happen. Whereas this happening didn't feel as logical. I feel like there were more obstacles to people to a company coming in and taking over a town and getting people that aren't prisoners in the prison. I felt like there were so many obstacles and no point did you see how they overcame those obstacles. Where in Handsmaid's Tale they did and that's what made it so creepy and that's what made it sneak up on you and made it such a genius book and this book is missing that. Yeah, and I, and I can see that, that they go from the... the their situation where they're living in the car to the Positron experience, it's it's like done. You know, yeah. they, they decide to do it and it's done. So there's no there's no sort of gradualization of of moving into this slightly w more weird society and more weird world. So yeah, I, I can see what you mean by that. Yeah. Though there's something to be said about the fact that they know they're being manipulated in there. Because remember, it's spend one night in our fancy hotel and then one night out in a motel. But the motel has like fake sounds of like an argument in the next room. Remember, it's like it's like a Disney World of horrible hotels with all the tropes. And then you know. <laughs> Which was actually probably better than the car. <laughs> yeah, it was probably still better than the car. But it was just it was funny that like they know they're being manipulated. How does that not tip them off to some shady stuff though? Like when they're and that's like, what I think this is missing. I think. If, if this, I think perhaps this book started in the wrong place, because if you're going to take us to such an extreme, you have to make that extreme feel like, feel like something people would think would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we got enough time before yeah. they made that decision to have that be a good idea. They had so many warning signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was it about them? that made it still a good idea, even though they knew all those warning signs. And that's what I think is undermining the world building of this story. Not only that, but Charmaine and Stan are sometimes, especially Charmaine, like a little like, there were moments, not always, where I was like, she's a little too stupid to function right now. Like she was kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, she was a little too stupid to function. Which I, I had a hard time 
believing. I don't. Mm-hmm. I I think um, she, in some ways, she was smarter than she was written. Like there were certain decisions she made that I thought she had to be smarter to make those decisions, and I would have appreciated her more if she had been smarter to make those decisions, or if I had seen. Like, you know, she's obviously had a rough childhood and some abuse. Like, like if I would have seen her see something really bad and make the decision to not see it, to shut down, I would have appreciated her more than to just see her as somebody that makes these ditzy decisions. Um, so I think that undermined her character a little bit. Yeah. Because I don't think she could have been that stupid. No, I found her sometimes a little annoying. Like, I was just like, you're really yeah, ditzy. Yeah, I would have cheated yeah. on her. <laughs> I would have dumped her. <laughs> like, yeah, she was and, really annoying. <laughs> and and to, go, to go from this sort of ditzy, flowered, pattern, curtain type, type woman. To the death angel. <laughs> to, 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 to the sort of woman who would, you know, it, it's such a stark contrast to the, the, the affair she has. Um, and. Yes, you think someone quiet like that might have a darker side to her, but but it was such a, a, a huge contrast. And, and you and see what? I, I love psychology, and so I get why she's like that, but it wasn't written on the page. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't on the page, but I can see how her abused background and her need to see things positive and just kind of color things over and hide her real self, but her real self is still there, and so it comes out in these messed up places because she's constantly suppressing in order to stay happy and undamaged and untraumatized. I would have liked to have seen that on the page. Mm-hmm. And, and Max, for being such an important plot device, as a character, had very little character development. Yeah, he was a plot device. You said it right yeah. there. Yeah, he was just like a plot device, but I felt like he had he had no agency even before they, they did the operation to him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the most disappointing thing for me was the characters. I just, there was no character that I liked or enjoyed disliking. Yeah. Well, I feel about, <clears throat> I like this book a lot. Um, I felt like it definitely could have gone deeper. I feel like it it touched on a lot of gray areas that I really appreciated. But how I feel about the whole book, I feel very conflicted about the book. Like if I sit down and try to rate it, I'm like, on one hand I want to rate it here, and on the other hand I want to rate it here. Like, you know, there are things I loved about it, like absolutely loved about it, and then there were things I was like, eh, this is a problem. Like, like it has flaws but it's really interesting and fun to read. Uh, yeah. I like on Netflix where when you hover over the stars and you're going to like read a show, it has like a phrase, like what phrase are you? Um, the, it's okay. That's my phrase. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Which is not what you expect from, from Margaret Atwood at all. Yeah, especially it since really the isn't. past books, it's, I loved it, you know? Mm. Yeah. But you know what? I had the same um, experience the first time the first time I read Neil Gaiman. I had heard about this book through, like, um, an interview, like, way before it was um, Ocean at the End of the Lane. I'd heard about it on a radio interview. I did had no idea who Neil Gaiman was. I'd never read Neil Gaiman. I didn't know, even afterwards, I didn't know anything about him. And so then everyone's talking about Neil Gaiman on Twitter, so I pick up Stardust. I read it, hated it. I felt so, I was like, why are people loving him? This is a fairy tale, there's no depth, there's no layers. I really didn't like him. And then later on I read Ocean at the End of the Lane, not realizing it was Neil Gaiman. And I loved it. And then I put two and two together that it was the same person. I was like, well, now I'm confused. And I kind of feel like that about Margaret Atwood, like her normal level of writing is here, but this book is probably uh, like several steps below where she normally is. I think some of that is issues with going from novella to novel, but even so, it does have inerrant flaws. And so it leaves me feeling really frustrated because yeah. it had, I feel like there was an opportunity for this book to go much deeper than it did. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I want to give credit for the fun read and the humor and the bravery of this book. And so, yeah, this whole, if that one sentence for me is I'm conflicted. Mm. Yeah. How about you, Gerald? What's your, like, takeaway impression? I guess almost our question is, like, would you recommend this book to other people or not really? 
Uh, I would recommend it. I would. I wouldn't recommend it as, from what you said, as, uh, and I will read more Margaret Atwood. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as as an example of her work. Um, I, I'd, I'd recommend it as, as an interesting story and a, and a good story, and, and I think that's that's what it is. And I think I, I keep coming back to this sort of string of novellas thing that that it the the, the sort of first section seems detailed and drawn out and interesting and 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 it seems like other sections although there's lots going on are sort of too compact and 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 it's like there's no there's no time to explore um the the depths that that perhaps we're looking for so so maybe again it's 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 the format of of how it was produced um, that, that's called and this. the scene plotting because I know what you mean about it felt compact but then some scenes seem to go on too long like mm. some I was like I don't need to be here on this couch this long again you know yeah, yeah I, I would recommend it um, I would not recommend it as your first experience with Margaret Atwood mm -hmm. mm. I would recommend you know um, personally I would recommend Handmaid's Tale because that novel has my heart on like a really deep level it's right up there with Fahrenheit working from fun like you know to me that is the novel, um, but I would recommend it as a second or third book of hers because it was really fun. Yeah. Like I, I have to give her credit. So while we're talking about all of the problems with this book, I had so much fun reading it, and that says something. And she covers a lot of ground, doesn't she? She covers a lot of a lot of ideas, a lot of plot lines, a lot of you know, and, and throwing a bit of humor in, and, and and throwing a bit of excitement, and at the end, you know, it. I think, you know, it's it's an it's, it's an amazing book in some respects, and perhaps not what what we would expect from her. Yeah, and I appreciate the fact that an established novelist with a reputation tried something new, mm -hmm. and that is a huge risk. Like, yeah. there are people that are hating on this book. There are some people that love it, but you read some of the reviews, not everybody likes this book, and that's brave for an established writer. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing I do love oh, about Oh, I remember what it was that made me laugh out loud. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. comment about ebooks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Because was it exactly? she has been very blatant, like, the whole hashtag Amazon thing. Like, she's, like, you know, about the electronic books taking over and... And Big Five need to survive, like that kind of thing. Like she has some significant problems with some of, with the way certain things are going right now in the publishing industry. And I was like, she got her little cat claws out there for a second. <laughs> it was pretty. Yeah. Funny. I totally stopped and I started laughing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, what I like about her is she never gets in the way of herself. She doesn't take herself as seriously as she could, given her success. And when you listen to her in interviews, she's just so not pretentious. No. Um, you know, it's funny, we're talking about, like, would you recommend this, would you not? And I had, like, I just, like, pictured a scene of, like, me in a bookstore somewhere that still exists, and there's, like, people talking about Margaret Atwood and saying, oh, I've never read her, I've never read her before. I'm going to buy The Heart Goes Last. I would rudely be like, no, 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 no. Read Hat Made Tale. Read, read the Mad Adam trilogy. Like, don't start there. And I think that mm -hmm. says a lot. And you know what? I think that she's one of these writers that doesn't take herself seriously, and I think she would probably say, no, 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 go read this other one first. Like, like I see her saying that about her own work. Yeah. And again, it's not that this is bad. I don't regret reading it. I didn't walk away from this feeling like I wasted time. She knows how to entertain people. She knows how to keep a plot moving. But it, it isn't... It, I, my, it wasn't... I remember I finished reading Oryx and Crake on a plane, and um, I, I remember just sitting on the plane looking around like, who can talk to me right now? Like, I need to talk right now about this book. And this book did not give you that. No. no. Yeah. I th yeah, I don't know what else to say. I think that's kind of... So how are we going to do this? It's the first episode. Are we going to do a, a rating? Are I'm... we going to, like, answer a question? I think, you know, it's our first show. We can... Do whatever we want. Exactly. I think instead of a rating with numbers, since the Kaneshi prophecy has taught us on the other show that rating with numbers is dangerous, we should rate with phrases. We should come up with like five phrases, which is like regret everything or would not recommend. I like I, it's okay. I like it. I love it. Like that. Like oh, I like that with, idea. I think mm. phrases make more sense because it grounds you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to rate it. 
I loved it, but it had problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm rating it. I liked it. I'm rating it. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I guess I just ex I just expect to walk away from a book a little more changed. That's all it is. Mm. You know, I I don't regret it, but I I wish I would have walked away changed. Speaking of, when you were mentioning Neil Gaiman and you were like, oh, I liked Ocean at the End of the Lane. Yeah, I also liked Ocean at the End of the Lane. But American Gods is one of his books that you walk away from it feeling like you want to rip off your own face because it's so good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, where Stardust, uh, I felt like, what did I just read? A children's fairy tale? Yeah. <laughs> American Gods is good. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Actually, I've never read Good Omens, and everyone says we have to read it, so maybe sometime this year we'll read it, but not next, because I already have the next book. So what are we going to read? I'm really excited. Yeah, mm. so February we're going to be discussing Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff. Anyone plugged into the literary community in 2015 has definitely heard of this book. Because um, it's gotten tons of buzz, everyone loves it, and I'm actually submitting it. Well, saying this is what we're reading, I guess, because yeah. I feel guilty I haven't read it yet. <laughs> so. As good a reason as any. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> okay, well, good, good first episode, guys. That was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Okay, so how are we gonna sign off? You just say bye. Yeah, we don't have a sign off. I don't know. Do we say I bye? To come up with one. Do I have an outro? Oh, maybe we remind people of the hashtag. Go read Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff. Let us know what you think as you're reading it on Twitter with, or anything, I guess, with hashtag LRH Book Club, right? No, L L R yeah. LRH. Yeah, LRH Book Club. Book Club. <laughs> and you can find the podcast at literaryroadhouse.com. Yes, and leave comments as well if you don't do Twitter. <laughs> Okay, I think that works. <laughs> we stop this broadcast.